There is no escaping it. Climate change is happening, and climate change is affecting us all. As Annabel said, I am a meteorologist. I work on African weather and I work on African climate. And climate change has massive implications for development in Africa. It is the continent that contributes the least greenhouse gases globally, but it stands to lose the most. The people I work with are the most disadvantaged, the most vulnerable in the. Uh, in the world, and the least able to adapt. Um, and an example of that is that 70% of the GDP in Africa depends on agriculture. That means, as climate change happens, pressures and climate change impacts on food and water supplies is going to make profound and direct threats on people's lives and livelihoods. In COP in Paris, coming up in December, there's going to be big discussions around sustainable development. But for the people in Africa, that seems a long way off. There is already huge extreme events which are causing people to lurch from one crisis to another, impacting on food and water supplies. For every drought, for every flood, there is disruption on agriculture, there's destruction of the very fragile infrastructure that exists there. And people are, are, are struggling. Um, and with all the pressure on natural resources, conflicts that we are hearing about in the news are just increasing. So everything is interconnected. People, food, water, financial security, stability. There's a lot of connections there that we all have to work with and address. And that, in itself, um, leads to one important missing factor. For people in Africa to be able to develop sustainably, we actually have to be able to, they have to be able to access climate information. And not only climate information, but they have to be able to use that climate information and be able to reap dividends from that climate information. So that provides a new context for development that we are trying to work within and the world is trying to work within and it's challenging. So this provides us an opportunity to engage with Africa and to move from very 20th century traditional practice and approaches to really take on 21st century challenges and to take them on together. So in 2005, I was a third-year doctorate student in meteorology. I went to my first African meteorology conference. The moment I landed in Senegal, I was absolutely smitten. The heat, the smells, the colours, it was intoxicating. My love affair with Africa began. And the conference halls were no less different. There was music, there was colour, there was laughter, there was light. And that sat really comfortably alongside intense debate because we weren't just talking research. What really mattered, real lives were at stake, forecasts really mattered. So, heading for the podium, presenting my first paper on African rainfall variability, I put on my jacket, I put on my heels, and I went to present my paper. The only sound in the room was the whir of this, the fans, breaking up the sort of the heat of the Sahel sun. And then there was just the standard Q&As, presentations, presentations, Q&As, and all these meteorologists getting terribly excited about convection schemes and global climate models and how could we improve the forecasts and move the world on. And then suddenly there was a question from the floor. And the question went as follows. Thank you, thank you for disseminating all that really useful information about your climate models. To be honest, I don't really care about the skill that you're working on and proving all these forecasts. That doesn't really matter to me, because I deal with meningitis, and actually all I need to know is, are they about 30% right, 40% right? Just give me the tolerance. I can work with that. We can then put in the systems that we need for Senegal to support meningitis in this country. And there was an absolute stunned silence. And this was my Damascus moment, if you like. So I suddenly thought, yeah, science. Science isn't for science's sake. Science is for society. So, 
given that science is for society, these are the climate models. How do we make them fit for purpose? How do we make them relevant? We have to do several things. We have to put at the heart people. We have to understand what they're doing. And in this spirit of the Damascus Road, I went out with a group of meteorologists to the northern Senegal a year later. And I went and worked with a group of smallholder farmers. And the brief was, the farmers want to understand the seasonal forecast. Like, oh, great, great, we can do that, we understand seasonal forecast. Fine, we'll go and work with these farmers. Spirit of communication, new context of development. So we went out, and the farmer said, so the forecast, we need to understand what crops to plant. Great, here's the forecast. And why is it that? So we did what all meteorologists do. Well, of course, it's easy to understand. Here's a picture of the Atlantic sea surface temperatures. And guess what? We were met by another sea of blank faces. And that was yet another salutary lesson about the, dis the disjoint and the gap and how we need to really link the science, put people and their needs at the front of, of, our, uh, of our work. And so I came back from all these conferences and I began to think a little differently about what we should be doing. If we're going to apply science, we need to get out and we need to listen. And we need to listen hard to what people need. So I started thinking harder about how we got to know people and we started going into different spaces. Understanding people was really critical and we're still learning. And I came back from Zimbabwe last week having had yet another important conversation just off chance, speaking to this with NGOs I was working with. And they were telling me about the women communities that they're working with at the moment. And I was listening hard. And they said, it's great, because we're in there and we're talking to them about climate change. Great. And climate change adaptation. Great. And the kind of strategies we might put in place. Fantastic. But then we were asked another question. I thought, oh, no, one of these questions. And the question this time was very grounding and just reminds us why it's really important to take our science into the right spaces and understand the context we're working in. Because the, one of the women in the group put up a hand and said, this is great, thank you for telling us about climate change. However, we get up at five in the morning and if you're ever in the Sahel, the sound you hear at five in the morning is people are pounding millet, pounding, it's hard work. I've seen, I've tried, I've lifted, it's hard work. And then they're out and they'll do a 10-mile lap filling jerry cans with water. And then, in the heat of the sun, they're out in the fields, the women are in the fields, ploughing, working, sifting, getting out the weeds. And then they're out finding the wood, because they're still using wood-burning stoves. And then they're using and trying to find as much food as they can to feed the family of 15. And so she said, and after all that, we're too exhausted to think about the future. I thought, yeah, I didn't think about that one. And that's an important point. We have to understand what the context is that we are working in. And this is a point where we don't compartmentalize our science. We have to bring the social sciences and the natural sciences all together if we're actually going to be able to create something that supports and helps people. So, listening and learning. A lot has changed over the last five years. For one thing, my perspectives on what's important has changed. For another thing, my heels have got a little bit less high. And that's important, because I do a lot of walking about and listening in the heat to the government people. Um, and in all this conversation that's going around globally, thinking about climate governance frameworks going forwards, it's all very well and good, but we actually have to act locally, and we have to understand and think about what, is really people, what do people really need, what are their perspectives. So it's about getting out there, and we have to find new spaces to work. And I'm often now outside my comfort zone, well outside my comfort zone, working in very different spaces and encouraging other people to get out there and be in different spaces. <clears throat> and a few months ago, I was in Burkina, 
This is an example of one of those spaces. There were no donors there. There were no research projects there. There was myself and another South African, and it was the Burkina Faso government sitting there, and it was the Burkina Faso NGOs, and it was the village leaders, and they were all sitting there saying, "What should our drought warning system look like? How do we design it? How do we build it?" And it was a privilege to be in that space because that's the space we want to be. That's the space that says, "What are your tick boxes?" How do we enable you to develop what you need? So we're approaching science from a different way. We're going from operations to research, and there are benefits from the scientists as well. But the really important thing is kicking off even those heels and putting on the trainers, because what we actually have to do is walk alongside these people. We have to understand and listen to what's going on, and we have to do. The, the research by 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 understanding what people actually want, but in all this, there's one more thing I want to mention, and that is, it's very important、um, in this new development context to re remember that there are still divisions between what, how we all think. We think about poor countries in a very different way to rich countries. Africa, the hopeless continent. Africa. If you look at those pictures, and I mean out in the field, these pictures look like UK in the 1850s. But populations increasing in Africa. Africa is not the hopeless continent. Africa is rising. Africa will be the leaders of this world in just a few short decades because of the population in that in that continent compared with everywhere else, and because of global conflicts, because of pandemics. Because of economic crises, we have to learn to cooperate and work together and learn from each other. Africa has development needs, but we have development needs, and we don't think about it like that. But I was very struck a couple of years ago. I ment mentor. It's very important that we spend time mentoring students from Africa. I, I had one of my students from Cameroon came over and was with me, and we were discussing poverty in Yaounde. And then he turned round to me and very gently, very Graciously said, but you have poverty too. You have exclusions. You have disengaged and disempowered communities too. And I thought, yeah, that is right. We have a lot to learn from each other. We have lessons to teach, and we have lessons to learn from each other. And this is a new context for development planning. The African Commission talked about a new base for development, one where there's mutual respect. Mutual solidarity, and when we learn from what works on the ground, and that's the space we're in now. And people, Africa is rising, and there is a right for everybody to have information and be empowered through that. And that leads me to this point, which has been used in TED before. It's so true. I am what I am because of who we all are. I'm very optimistic. There are, things have changed. We've all learned to wear different heels, and I'm optimistic that there is a change going on, and there is a different approaches, and people are beginning to take forward the 21st century challenges. There are many more people now putting their head above the parapets and saying, "We want to make a difference. We want to, we want to make things、uh, better." And there's a network growing,、um, but it's still a long way to go, and we need to spread the idea of linking policy and practice and science. Uh, much better, and to be part of the same、uh, landscape, and understand that we can all learn and need each other. And what does this mean in practice? Well, apart from the fact that we're all learning to walk together and listen, and I'll often go around in the field with my scarf. It does mean that in practice now, it, we're no longer in a world where, assuming the scientist goes around with their badge and goes, "Right, we're a scientist. We know best." That's not the case. And I was reminded of this very crucially、uh, a few weeks ago. I was working down in East Africa. I was working on Lake Wamala, and I was told to go and we were told and advised in our research to go out there and support these fishing communities, tell them about climate change, learn, help them support with them with their adaptation strategies. So we all went out to listen, 
But when we got there, we found that these fishing communities, only 5% of their income was coming from fishing. These were just mixed farming communities. They'd already learned to adapt. The lakes were already empty. These are lakes that are just off Lake Victoria, one and a half meters in depth all the way across, no fish left. The lakes were being used to transport cabbages from one landing site to another, to take the bricks that this person has now, the fisherman's become a brick maker, and to travel and take those bricks over. And that was, again, an important lesson. We don't know best. We have to get in and understand and work with the context and where, where people are coming from and on their own needs. So, I've touched on a few of these through this, through this talk. The important points to take for home, we're all equal value. Our interconnections and interactions matter. We all have something to teach and something to learn from one another. What affects one affects us all, and we can all benefit from sharing and mutual respect. I'll tell you something, I'm much more comfortable in my trainers rather than in my heels. I'm certainly no taller now than the people I'm having conversations with. And we all walk at the same pace, and it's a pace that suits us all. So, is it time to change your shoes? Thank you.